Zai Chun, page 42. Cassie had taken the kids north a handful of times when the storms had gotten close, but she was hoping she wouldn't have to make the trip this time. She had work to do over the weekend, and the kids had plans, and she always came back from those trips more exhausted than when she'd left. Almost without exception, whether it was fleeing a storm or for a weekend vacation, Kathy and the kids had to go without Zaytun. Her husband had trouble leaving the business, had trouble relaxing for days on end, and after years of this vacationless life, Kathy had threatened to pack the kids and just leave for Florida some Friday after school. At first, Zaytun hadn't believed her. Would she really pack up and leave with or without him? She would, and she did. One Friday afternoon, Zaytun was checking on a nearby job and decided to stop at home. He wanted to see the kids, change his shirt, pick up some paperwork. But when he pulled into the driveway, there was Kathleen loading up the minivan, the two youngest already buckled inside. Where are you going, he asked. I told you, I'd go with or without you. And we're going. They were going to Destin, Florida, a beach town on the Gulf about four hours away with a long white beaches and clear water. Come with us, Daddy, Nanama pleaded. She had just come out of the house with her snorkeling gear. Zaytun was too stunned to react. He had a hundred things on his mind, and a pipe at one of the rental properties had just burst. How could he go? Nanama got in the front seat and put on the seatbelt. Bye-bye, Kathy said, backing out. See you Sunday. And they were gone, the girls waving as they left. He didn't go that Friday, but after that, he no longer doubted Kathy's resolve. He knew she was serious, that in the future he'd be consulted on vacation plans, but the trips to Florida or beyond would and could and would happen with or without him. So over the years, there were other trips to Destin and even made it on a few of them. But always a decision was made at the last minute. One time, Kathy was late in getting started, and he was so late in deciding that he couldn't even pack. She was in the driveway, backing out, and he pulled in. Now or never, she said, barely stopping the car. And so he jumped in the car. The girls giggled to see their dad in the back seat, still in his work clothes, dirty and sweating, as much from the stress of the decision as from the day's work. Zaytun had to buy beach clothes when they got to Florida. Kathy was proud that she'd gotten him to Destin once a year. Zaytun didn't mind going, too, much because... Given how close it was, he knew he could come back at any time, and more than once he had cut a vacation short because of some problem at one of the work sites. By 2002, Kathy, though, Kathy wanted something that really felt like a vacation, and she knew she had to do something drastic. In all of their time together, eight years at this point, he had never taken more than two days off in a row. She knew that she had no choice but to kidnap him. She started by planning a week in Destin. She chose a weekend when she knew things would be calm at work. It was just after Christmas, and there was rarely much work to laugh well after New Year's. As usual, Zaytun wouldn't commit till the last minute, so she took the precaution of actually packing a bag for him and hiding it in the back of the minivan. Because she made sure the weekend was quiet, he came along, as always, at the last minute. Kathy told him she'd drive him because he was exhausted. He agreed. She made sure the kids were quiet. They were in on the plan. He soon fell asleep, drooling on his seatbelt. While he slept, Kathy drove right on through Destin and onward down the paunch of Florida. Each time he woke up, she would say, almost there, go back to sleep, and thankfully he would. He was so tired. And it wasn't until an hour north of Miami that he realized they weren't going to Destin. Kathy had driven straight down to Miami, 17 hours. She checked on the computer for the warmest place in the country that week. And Miami was it. Being that far away was the only way to ensure he would take a real vacation, a full week's worth of rest. Every time she thought back on the gamut and how well it had worked, Kathy smiled to herself. A marriage was a system like any other, and she knew how to work it. At about 2.30, Ahmad called Zaytun again. He was still tracking the storm from his computer in Spain. Doesn't look good for you, he said. Zaytun promised he would keep watch on it. Imagine the storm surge, Ahmad said. Zaytun told him he was paying close attention. Why not leave? Just to be safe, Ahmad said. Kathy decided to go to the grocery store before picking up the girls from school. You could never tell when people would make a run on the basics before a storm arrived, and she wanted to avoid the crunch. Crush. She went to the mirror to adjust the habab, brushed her teeth, and left the house. Not that she thought about it much, but any trip to the grocery store or to the mall presented the possibility that she would encounter some kind of ugliness. The frequency of incidents seemed tied, to some extent, to current events, to the general media profile of Muslims that week or month, certainly after 9-11, it was more fraught than before, 
And then it had calmed for a few years. But in 2004, a local incident had stoked the fire again. At West Jefferson High School, a 10th grader of Iraqi descent had that been repeatedly harassed by her history teacher. He called Iraq a third world country and worried that the student would bomb us if she ever returned to Iraq. In February of that year, while passing out tests, the teacher had pulled back the girl's up and said, I hope God punishes you. No, I'm sorry. I hope Allah punishes you. The incident was widely reported. The student filed a lawsuit against him and the termination was recommended by the Jefferson Parish School District Superintendent. The school board overruled. He was given a few weeks suspension and returned to the classroom. After the decision, there had been an uptick in minor harassment of Muslims in the area, and Kathy was aware of the invitation she was providing in going out in her hijab. There was a new practice in vogue at the time, favored by adolescent boys or those who thought like them. Sneak up behind a woman wearing a headscarf, grab it, and run. One day it happened to Kathy. She was shopping with Asma, a friend who happened to be Muslim, but who wore no hijab. Job. Asma was originally from Algeria and had been living in the U.S. for 20 years. She had usually taken before Spanish. Kathy and Asma were leaving the mall, and outside, Kathy was trying to remember where she'd parked her car. She and Asma were on the sidewalk, Kathy squinting at the row of gleaming cars. When Asma We're on the sidewalk, Kathy squinting at the rows of gleaming cars when Asma gave her a funny look. Kathy, there's a girl behind you. A girl of about 15 was crushed by Kathy, her arm raised, about to yank the chub off Kathy's head. Kathy cocked her head. You got a problem, she barked. The girl covered and cowered and slunk away, joining a group of boys and girls her age, of whom all had been watching. Once back with her friends, the girl directed some choice words, Kathy, us way. Her friends laughed and echoed her, cursing at Kathy in half a dozen different ways. They could not have expected Kathy to return the favor. They assumed no doubt that a Muslim woman, presumably submissive and shy with her English, would allow her job to be ripped from her head without retaliation. But Kathy let loose a fusillade of pungent suggestions, leaving them dumbfounded and momentarily speechless. On the drive home, even Kathy was shocked by what she'd said. She had been brought up around plenty of cursing and knew every word and provocative construction. But since she'd become a mother, since she'd converted, she hadn't sworn more than once or twice, but those kids needed to learn something and she'd obliged. In the weeks after the attacks on the Twin Towers, Kathy saw very few Muslim women in public. She was certain they were hiding, leaving home only when necessary. In late September, she was in Walgreens when she finally saw a woman in Jabab. She ran to her. Salam Akram, she said, taking the woman's hands. The woman, a doctor studying at Tulane, had been feeling the same way, like an exile in her own country, and they laughed at how delirious they were to see each other.